Ugh. Fuck this movie. Fuck. I'm not even gonna mince words here, just... Fuck this movie. This is Rebecca, the latest adaptation of the original novel by Daphne du Maurier. In 1940, it was made into a film directed by Alfred Hitchcock, and at the time, this was a huge success for him. It was kind of his transition from making a lot of films in Europe to suddenly coming into Hollywood. It was the first, or actually the only film, sadly, that ever won an Oscar that he made. And I know that nobody really cares about Rebecca, but you know what? Fuck it, I care. And so y'all are just gonna have to deal with it because this movie, this remake, pissed me off that much. I grew up watching the original Hitchcock film. I love it. I like it, you know, I put it in kind of the same sort of category as Gone with the Wind. It's not as good as Gone with the Wind, but you know, where it's like, I recognize that it has a lot of flaws, but I think it has a lot of great things in it. And it came from a time, you know, those grand sort of epic movies, those melodramas from old Hollywood, where it's like, if, you, if you're watching it on TV, if you're flipping channels and you see it, it's like, I, I have to watch the whole thing. I just get sucked into it every time. So the original has a very special place in my heart. It definitely is not one of Hitchcock's finest works by any means, but it does have some very promising things in it and things that certainly stay with you. It has mood, it has ambiance, it has claustrophobia that is really, you know, signature Hitchcock, though not as distinct as it would become in the future. And all that's very important because this is supposed to be kind of a gothic sort of story that roots you in the paranoia of the protagonist's mind. Well, the story here is of a young lady who um, marries a very rich man that is older than her, much older than her, named Maxim de Winter. She does this very quickly out of passion and certainly also because of her circumstances, because when he meets her, you know, she's young, she has no money, she has uh, no family to speak of, and really, you know, her situation is looking like it's not going to improve much. Her opportunities seem sadly very limited, so she says yes, understandably, to this man, and I think many people in the same position would do the same. But you know, she did dive into a marriage very quickly after knowing somebody for a very, very short time. Uh, it was a big gamble. So I think the whole movie is kind of her wrestling with, was this the right decision? And was this the right decision for him? And I think a lot of that is what makes the film very sad for me, the original film. But this whole story, and I think the idea behind what makes it so powerful, is that it's all about implication. It's all about perceptions. This young girl kind of suddenly being wealthy and expected to be this you know, woman of the house, this, of this huge estate. Yet everyone is comparing her to her husband's late wife who died years ago named Rebecca. And based on what everyone's saying, apparently she was just the most beautiful, charming, witty, sexy, just perfect woman of the house. And this new unnamed protagonist just feels so insecure, like she could never measure up to Rebecca. So all this insecurity is settling in, all this paranoia, and we are meant to feel all of that claustrophobia in the symbol of this huge house. It's called Manderley, the estate. It's not surreal necessarily, it's not horror necessarily, yet you can imply a lot of those elements. Then there's a twist that's very, very important, and then the story suddenly kind of transitions more into kind of a, like a realist crime drama. So I sit here and I watch this new film, Rebecca, for 2020 on Netflix, and I think to myself, what is the point? Why remake this? I personally have always thought, watching the original film, that it would be very interesting to see how they would remake it. And I, I say remake, I know this is saying it's an adaptation of the novel, but come on. I mean, the movie and the film are so similar in structure, so much so that you, you have to compare them. It's impossible not to, especially if you've seen the original as many times as I have. And they're nearly the same length as well. But again, why remake it? For me, I think one of the most interesting things that would be interesting to explore in a more modern lens is the relationship between Maxim de Winter and his new wife, because you know, the way he treats her is very questionable, and you get a sense of that very early on in the story. He has a very serious temper, he's condescending to her, and he treats her like a child, which is very weird, rather than a, a wife. He is very charismatic, very handsome, but also very intimidating. He has a real presence about him. And she is quite terrified of him, but she wants to please him so badly. She is just so innocent, and that part of it is very sad. There's something very tragic about their relationship, and I always thought it would be really hard to make this movie in the modern day without having a bunch of, you know, woke 
new wave feminist whining about the way that he treats her. When actually I think their relationship is what makes the film interesting because it's authentic. It, it's a realistic portrayal of what relationships are. And that, ladies, to me, is true respect. There's also a lot of chances to explore some homoerotic subtext that is really in there, some overtones, really, if you want to think about it. And then there's insinuated dark humor as well. Um, but so you could do all of this through a modern lens if you if you wanted to. And also, you know, as I said, I, I've seen the original probably like 30 times, um, but it's not a masterpiece. There are definite flaws. It lacks balance. I think it's too uneven to be considered among Hitchcock's great works. And which, I mean, that's another reason why I think a remake would be intriguing because, you know, you should take those weaknesses and see if you can expand on them and explore them. But no, this new film is a vapid, expensive Vanity Fair fashion ad that was, it looks like it's shot by like imitation Annie Leibovitz. No respect for the original material. No respect for character building or building of tension. This is just a chance to put your production team to work, to put your art directors, your costume designers, your set designers all to work, while the rest is an empty, shallow, rudimentary shell of a movie. And it doesn't know what it wants to be. It's dabbling in a lot of different genres that could be interesting, but um, it has no idea how to incorporate that into the themes without it becoming super, super obvious and really insulting. And the result is just a chaotic, flat, boring mess of a movie. Let's start with the performances, the main ensemble in the new film, because this movie is very ensemble driven, and if you don't have really good actors at the center of it, the whole thing falls apart. Our protagonist is played by Lily James, and then her dashing, debonair, charismatic husband is played by Army Hammer. And in the first 20 minutes of the movie where they meet, you know, right up into the point where he asks her to marry him, I actually didn't mind them all that much. I mean, she's cute, she's charming enough, and he's fine, and that's usually how I feel about Army Hammer in almost every single movie he does. He's fine, you know, he's... He's better on talk shows. But once they get to Mandalay, once they go back to England and they are at this haunted estate that is really going to become a symbol and be this wedge between them that builds tension, that's when the performances are really gonna be put to the test. And that is where you have your work cut out for you as an actor, because you know these arcs need to be very defined and you need to grow. And neither of these actors really possess those characteristics of authenticity you know, for these specific characters. You know, I think Lily James, she tries. I don't think that she is a bad actress. Um, you know, I think she's likable at times, but she's far too secure in her skin to make this a realistic portrayal of this character. She's too gutsy, she's too self-aware, and all of that to me is just, it's, it's all wrong. The original role went to Joan Fontaine, and I thought she was absolutely perfect in the role because she really embodies everything down to the body language. You know, she just constantly feels so awkward in her own skin. She's supposed to be diminutive, shy, and awkward, and somebody that uh, does not want to draw attention to themselves. And Joan Fontaine, you know, when anytime she tries to put on a fancy dress, she just looks so awkward. Like the way she kind of holds her body, she slouches a lot, she hunches her shoulders, and people walk all over her. And I think that is much more realistic to what, you know, a character like that might really be like. And Joan Fontaine, you know, she's she's very pretty, very pretty, but she's not glamorous. And, you know, when she tries to be really sexy for her husband, it's, it's really funny because he'll just be like, what are you doing? And I love that kind of stuff between them. There's none of that in this movie, really. And Army Hammer, he just, he, I'm sorry, he does not have near the charisma or the range as an actor to portray a character as complex and mysterious as Maxim de Winter. And the Maxim in the original film is the legendary Laurence Olivier, and as if, you know, Army Hammer was ever going to even come close to that. Olivier, to me, captures all of that range. You know, he is sweet at times and charming, of course, like I said, very charismatic, and you are drawn to him, certainly, from the moment you see him. But, you know, he's also very scary at times, and I myself feel very intimidated when he looks like he's about to, you know, burst a blood vessel, when he's about to lose his temper. And with Army Hammer, when he starts to lose his temper, it's almost cute. You know, I don't buy it for a second. It never comes alive. She seems stronger than he does, and she seems more forthright, and that's just really inaccurate. And that, to me, screams of, like, you know, we need to force kind of independent women and feminism down people's throats. Maybe the best performance here, if you can say that, would maybe go to Kristen Scott Thomas, and she plays the iconic Mrs. Danvers. But also with her, too, you know, she's, she's a very good actress, I think, but just in this, she's too self-aware in her portrayal, and I think that you know, as she goes along, her performance does escalate into camp. 
And, you know, in the original it does as well, but with uh, Kristen Scott Thomas it kind of stays on that level, so therefore a lot, most of the tension, all of the tension really is lost. Judith Anderson, who played her in the original, is an extraordinary character actress from the uh, old period, and she, as the character, is full of mystery, full of ambiguity, and, you know, there's hints of different things happen. She has like a prickly demeanor. At some times it can be bordering on soap opera, um, but she's never fully anything at one time. She's just giving us little hints along the way, and that to me is the sign of a really great performance. This new film lacks the subtlety, the intimacy, the slow build that I would expect from a story like this that I get in the original Hitchcock film. Hitchcock has this amazing ability, as we all know, you know, to create mood. He was a master of that, a master of suspense. And when you watch this movie, it's like the house becomes this haunted presence, almost as if it's a character on its own. When Joan Fontaine goes into Rebecca's room for the first time, it's really like, you know, you're, you're sitting on the edge of your seat almost. The shadows and the way the curtains move, it's almost as if the room is breathing as if it has the pulse of Rebecca in it, and it's all very chilling. And then you look at that scene and how it's done in the new movie, and you know, it has this very bad bluish color grading that is way over the top, and there's maybe one long shot of the room, and the rest are a series of close-ups uh, in this sort of almost montage -y style, and you don't get any sense of life from it, any sense of the fear or the dominance. And the intent here is just so muddled. It's as if they just threw this all together and they didn't think through anything at all. You know, it wants to be kind of a gothic period piece, but you know, it also has influences like, um, even early in the film, you get kind of like the 60s, late 60s kind of folk music going on. There's a sort of like hazy youthfulness to it at times and I think to myself, hmm, okay, you know, where are they gonna go with this? Then at times it feels like a like a teen drama, like a la Carrie, Brian De Palma. And then it's, you know, pulling from more of like late 70s surrealist like Euro trash horror with like the, you know, the bright colors and, you know, sort of sensuality, I guess you could say, emanating from it, or I should say attempted sensuality. But no connective tissue brings any of these elements together at all. And it's more like they chose them just because they are trendy. They are in vogue at the moment. It's like, oh, everybody is doing this sort of surreal, it's all in your mind thing for A24 movies. So we're just gonna do the same without any consideration for what it means in a greater context. Everything in this movie is on the surface, and I mean everything. It touches on surrealism with dream sequences, um, but <laughs> all the subtext there is just, it's handed to you on a silver platter. Mr. De Winter sleepwalking towards Rebecca's room. And then, you know, the new Mrs. De Winter, she's getting pulled down by these vines and all of a sudden she wakes up from her nightmare and the irony is that her bedspread has the same vine print, as does the drapes in her bedroom. A good dream sequence does not reveal all the subtext to you. It gives you key aspects or key elements of that subtext, while often blurring the rest so that you do feel disoriented. You do feel somewhat blindsided, but even if you don't recognize it right away, you are being given small hints, small keys that are progressing the story. And yes, I know this is a melodrama. It's supposed to be, you know, very over the top and all of that. Um, and there are going to be elements of it that are operatic and sometimes bordering on laughable. That's totally fine. Um, but you can create that in a cinematic, sophisticated, sort of way. And Hitchcock did that. He went more for the intimacy. He didn't go for surrealism or dream sequences, but all of it is, again, like I said, it's hinted at. That's what makes you uncomfortable about the original, is that so much is hidden from the viewer. So we, just like the protagonist, are going on her journey and trying to discover our answers. And how can you do that when every trick, every visual cliche in the book is being thrown at your face. The luxurious sets and the gorgeous, you know, locations and all of that and the designer three-piece suits that Army Hammer wears, you know, it's like, it just feels like this is a chance to get a bunch of, um, you know, beautiful people together and uh, get paid lots of money to play house. And of course, get some good shots for the trailer and for the entertainment weekly spread. Um, but then the result of it feels like it's a Ryan Murphy miniseries for FX and nobody, nobody, wants that. And I just need to point out, speaking of aesthetic, it's not important, but I don't give a shit. You know, this is the kind of stuff that pisses me off because it's, it's like, it's so historically inaccurate. So this movie takes place in the 1930s, right? And in, like, the protagonist is constantly wearing pants, which, look, I mean, people wore pants, but it was not very common for women to wear pants a lot of the time. Often if you wore pants, you were considered quite spunky and independent and somebody who was trying to, 
you know, be less traditional. A Katherine Hepburn type, we'll say. But the young Mrs. De Winter is not supposed to be like a Katherine Hepburn, somebody who wants to consciously go against the grain and be very ballsy. No, she's somebody who I said is very shy and she wants to blend in and not draw attention to herself. She is very plain and very awkward and I like how in the original movie how, you know, she's just wearing very simple blouse, very simple skirts, simple shoes, not particularly flattering. Very modest, like she wants to hide, like she just wants to blend into the background and, and please everybody. And that's just in her nature. It's realistic to the character. And this, like I said, it just feels like they're trying to force this feminist uh, independent narrative down our throats. And it feels almost more like a like animated movie, like, like Anya from Anastasia. I know what they were doing. They were going for like, oh, she's the tomboy type. So it kind of separates her from the rest of the women of the time and certainly separates her from Rebecca. But it's just, it's so nauseating. It's so on the nose. It's all wrong. This is like somebody who looked at a catalog of fashion in the 1930s and they think, oh, I've studied it. I know everything. And I feel that way about so many aspects of the aesthetic in this film. It's like when they do art deco. It looks like art deco that was done by somebody who has no concept of what real art deco is really like. And so what's the point of having all these beautiful sets and all these beautiful clothes and all that stuff if you don't know how to use them? And especially when you have all this and you're draining all of the mystery and all the tension and kind of the haunting aspects of this house, there's none of that. And that's the whole point. Now I will say, I know I'm bashing this movie pretty hard, but uh, there is one thing that I do commend them on where they at least tried to improve on, I think, the original Hitchcock film. They failed hard, but at least they tried. One of the things I really struggle with in the Hitchcock film, among several things, is uh, the second half of the movie. And I often struggle with the second halves of Hitchcock films um, because often, you know, it builds so brilliantly and then the payoff isn't quite as strong or as original or unique. And one of the big issues I have with the second half of the 1940 Rebecca is how we lose our main character in it. She kind of gets lost among the shuffle in the second half, which I said before is it becomes more of like a realist kind of crime drama. It's no longer her story at that point and all of the risk and everything is, is resting more on the shoulders of Maxim de Winter. And I think in order for that film to truly be successful and carry all the way through, it needed to keep things centered in her mind, in her perceptions of things, uh, her point of view, but they don't. So therefore maybe the last five, 10 minutes, you know, I feel kind of disconnected from things and they're just, the, the ending isn't as satisfying. But in the new one, to their credit, they did keep the main actress, the, the main, the protagonist, the focal point, even if, you know, the dilemma is now more on Maxim's shoulders. She is taking part in cracking the mystery more. Now, the way it is handled is embarrassing and laughable and just awful. She basically turns into like a Nancy Drew slash action hero in the last, you know, act of the movie. At least in the original, even though there are some things that don't make sense, it does try to stay rooted in reality. Um, but with this one, I appreciate the effort, I guess. But in the new one, the ending is way worse. It's way, way worse than the original. As confused as I was in terms of what this, I thought this adaptation thought it was trying to say, the final maybe 60 seconds and especially the final shot of this new movie had me so confused. It's one of those happy endings that's supposed to be deceptive in the final shot where you just see maybe a flash of, you know, something new in this character, maybe her sexual awakening, you know, she's now a worldly woman. But there have been very little breadcrumbs that have led us up to that point to make that seem like a satisfying payoff and as though it was the core arc of the story. Rarely is there ever any sexiness in that movie. And so it doesn't really make sense to have that a key point of her evolution in the end of the story. It feels like a weird tacked on contrivance that is supposed to get people going like, ooh, but really I was just kind of like, what? So I didn't care for this movie very much at all. And you know, I wasn't expecting much. When I heard there was going to be a remake and it was going to star Lily James and Army Hammer, I was like, oh God, that is gonna suck. And it sucked, but maybe even more than I, I thought it would, which is really, really shocking. And I guess I think what makes me angry here is like I said at the beginning, you had a chance to really explore a lot of things in a more modern way through a modern lens you know, opposed to, as opposed to 1940. And I think that they maybe tried in some ways, you could sense maybe 
a, a taste for curiosity in this movie because you know some of the aesthetic choices and some of the the um, genre influence here it's consciously you know making you aware of them and yet none of them work so it's all just a mess it feels like a really bad student work that was given a crazy overblown budget for no reason whatsoever and maybe i'm old school maybe i'm just poor but i hate the idea of you know a ton of money going towards something where you gain absolutely nothing from it you feel nothing from it i can't imagine a single person who would want to watch a movie like this if you are going to watch anything please 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 watch the original movie really it's it's a good movie i think it's even though it's flawed you know, it really draws you in. And it's cool just to see more early Hitchcock when he arrives in Hollywood. But please just don't, do not waste your time with the Netflix version. And that is my review. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you look over here, you will see my Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome. As always, the link to support is below. Also, you can check out my website. I am an artist. I sell prints as well as commission portraits. So if you're interested, certainly uh, email me or whatever. I'm happy to work with you. My social media information and all that is below. You can watch more videos here and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.